Thanks. So please, uh, when you're ready, uh, Chris, go ahead. Great, thanks, Bronson, and thanks for this uh, initiative. So I'm at Monash University in a material science and engineering department. I'm a physicist by background, um, but find myself now sort of working at the interface between uh, the device physics of these materials and the material science of them and understanding how the microstructure forms and how the microstructure interplays with then um, device performance. Um, so we are amongst friends, so we don't really need to motivate things too much. Um, so obviously organic semiconductors are going to save the world. They're going to give us great looking displays. They're going to give us flexible um, displays like you see in the movies, and they're going to give us low cost solar panels, which are going to be everywhere. Um, and we'll have no naysayers or dissenters on that front. Um, but seriously, what sort of makes them quite interesting is you can combine the uh, mechanical properties of things like plastics, um, which are sort of lightweight, flexible, with the semiconducting properties typically associated with inorganic materials like silicon. Um, but my interests are really sort of around well, how do we uh, understand the sort of the interface between, particularly with semiconducting polymers, the polymer physics of these materials, because as polymers, they're uh, quite interesting in their own right in terms of their, their geometry and, and architecture, and then their materials properties um, being interesting semiconductor materials in their own right. So with conjugated polymers, I like to draw these cartoons, and my group works largely with conjugated polymers and certainly exclusively with solution process materials. Um, so if we have something like polythrohexylthiophene, there's the conjugated backbone where all the uh, optical and electronic action happens and we have alternating single and double bonds. That ends up being relatively inflexible, certainly from a polymer perspective. We've got a lot of double bonds and fused rings, so that can make the backbone um, sort of quite planar and sort of tape-like. And we get solubility by having these flexible side chains which stop um, aggregation of the um, the backbone units in, in the solution state. So these um, metal rings and the like like to pie stack and so um, getting them dissolved in solution requires these side chains. Side chains also have an important role to play in how the materials pack together and our polymers can be semi-crystalline, they could be completely amorphous, but typically the most interesting semiconducting polymers are semi-crystalline and they sort of tend to stack in this fashion where we have pi pi stacking, uh, we have um, uh, lamella stacking where the side chains order in this direction, and then we have the backbone along this way. So charge transport is typically best along the backbone, the longer the charges can stay on the backbone and travel along there, the better. They can also transport relatively good between the pi pi uh, planes here and the transport in that direction is still pretty lousy. When we make a film, we get a mess, so we're going to have some semi-crystalline domains, we're going to have some amorphous domains, and our charges have got to somehow find their way through this maze uh, where the energetic barriers that go from a region, a highly ordered region to a disordered region is going to be difficult. So we make all of our semiconducting polymer films um, by solution processing. One of the common techniques is spin coating, uh, which is put on a small scale in the lab environment. Um, this process happens very quickly, and so uh, the polymer films don't end up being in an equilibrium state and the microstructure gets um, quenched in. Uh, also, it's very complicated, so you can see there's a lot of different dynamics happening and flow lines going in different directions. So our polymer chains uh, typically tend to be lying flat in plane, but the backbone directions are typically randomly oriented on the length scale of the entire substrate. So we can do other things um, which are more relevant for industrial applications, such as a uh, bar coating where you then have uh, something like a, a rod or a bar or a blade even that then uh, coats a uniform layer over large areas. Um, so this is coating on a transparent substrate with some electrode rays for transistors from a group in Korea. Um, and you can see as the film dries, which changes from this sort of pinky color um, to this Berkeley color. So those drying kinetics are also important. You can see some of it's drying left to right, some of it's drying right to left. Um, and that can have an influence on microstructure as well. So we've been quite interested in this polymer for quite a while, PNDI 2OD-T2, also known as N2200 by its commercial name. It was one of the first polymers to get electromobilities above one centimeter square per volt second. 
and it has an interesting microstructure, so it does adopt this lamella stacking structure, it tends to pack face on at least in the bulk, um, but we've also done work showing it has an edge on layer at the surface, which is typically uh, uh, ubiquitous, at least when we do those measurements comparing surface structure with bulk mic microstructure. It shows some very interesting solvatochromism as well. And so when in the polymer physics community, we're in general interested in how polymer chains behave in solution. Um, do they adopt open coil configurations? Do they collapse down into collapsed globules? And that's all determined by um, the sort of balancing between monomer-monomer interactions and monomer-solvent interactions. So if the monomer units don't bind the solvent molecule too much, maybe they will um, open up and freely um, associate with the solvent. If they don't like the uh, solvent that much, they might then clap down and sort of aggregate in solution. And what's interesting from a semiconductor polymer perspective is that this can be accompanied by changes in color. So what you can't do with things like polystyrene or PMA, you can't just look at it, the color of the solution and tell whether the, the polymer is changing a behavior or not. But with semiconducting polymers, you can see this um, by eye. So in that sense, it's kind of, in one sense, it's left the, um, the community be a bit lazy because they can just make these associations and say, okay, if we have this uh, blue color here, that's a good solvent. And so the polymer must have an open chain conformation. And as we go through to this green color, it's collapsing. And so it must have this kind of confirmation, but that doesn't tell the whole story. And it doesn't tell a story on the length scale of the actual polymer chain. So these optical effects are only really influenced by very short range interactions. And so if it is aggregated, we can't tell what's the size of that aggregate, what's the geometry of that aggregate. So one of my PhD students uh, was working on this project, looking at how different solvents then affect the actual behavior of transistors. So the transistors we're making, uh, uh, top gate, bottom contact transistors. And so we make these devices in our, in our lab. Um, and these are typical JV curves we get from them. Uh, so we're depositing from different solvents. We are typically annealing the semiconducting layer to optimize it, then putting down the cytop layer as a dielectric and a um, gate dielectric on top of that. So these are the transfer characteristics. So we tend to get nice looking transfer characteristics, straight lines, no funny business associated with kinks or bends in the gate voltage characteristics, which enable us to give a, a reliable estimate of phone mobilities. So the first thing we were looking at is then, okay, if we vary the, the solvent and we can confirm that we get the same uh, changes in solvent quality as we go from things like chloronaphthalene through to toluene, how do the mobilities um, vary? And we can kind of group things into sort of tolerably good solvents, which are things like um, dichlorobenzene or a mixture of xylene and chloronaphthalene, tolerably poor solvents, which are things like chloroform and chlorobenzene, and then poor solvents such as xylene and toluene. This is based on analysis done by others um, with sort of the photophysics. And in general, there's an uptrend as you go from good solvents to poor solvents, um, though the, um, you might be skeptical of these error bars. Certainly, I was taught in first year physics that if your error bars are larger than your variability, uh, then how can you conclude that a poor solvent's actually any better? So there's actually a physical origin for why we get these large error bars, which we'll come to later. Um, but in general, for some reason, poor solvents tend to give better mobility than uh, good solvents. So going on then to look at the microstructure, uh, the first thing we check is, is AFM, which is quite straightforward to do. And immediately we can see sort of trends as we're going from our good solvents through to our poor solvents. Uh, so the Better solvents tend to sort of show these kind of pinwheel type structures where we see fibrils, um, but the long axis of these fibrils doesn't really show a consistent correlation over the length scale of the image. Uh, so these images are about two by two microns. So in this dichlorobenzene, you can see some fibrils pointing this way, then over this part of the image, they're pointing that way. So there's no long range correlated order. There might be some very short range correlated order in the way the fibrils are orienting, um, but it's pretty uh, random. As we go to things like chlorofen, uh, chloroform and chlorobenzene, you start to see sort of these look like flow lines where the, we do see longer range correlations between the ordering of fibrils. And then to our uh, poor solvents such as toluene and, and xylene, it looks like they have a consistent uh, orientation extending over the entire image of the um, AFM image. 
So we wanted to then understand, well, how does the solution behavior um, determine this in a bit more detail? So instead of just relying entirely on UV vis, uh, we started doing things like um, solution SACs and more recently also um, uh, solution SANS. So in a small angle X-ray or small angle neutron scattering experiment, you have your solution, your X-ray beam comes in and you're looking at scattering to small angles. So if this is your sample, the detector, at least at the synchrotron, is about um, 10, 15 meters down the hutch. So looking at very small angles, which then give us access to uh, larger scale features. So X-ray diffraction is looking at much, much tinier features. Um, this small angle X-ray scattering is looking at much larger features going from more than about the 100 nanometers up to tens of microns length scale. Um, and qualitatively, you can tell information about the, the slope of the curves you see. Uh, so if you have a sort of a rod-like geometry, it'll have a more Q to one, minus one dependence on X-ray intensity on scattering vector. Um, and qualitatively, then you can tell maybe you might have it more plate-like or more three-dimensional. If we have a really uh, narrow distribution of shape sizes, we might also see uh, fringes like this, but typically for polymers, we don't have, we have a, a large range, large distribution of shapes, sizes. So we, um, we will kind of, kind of see a, a, a broad, we won't see these fringes. So when we looked at the um, SACS patterns of um, our polymers in different solutions, we see quite different trends. Uh, so the poor solvents we see uh, more sort of Q to the minus one type slopes. And then we sort of see steeper slopes with things like chlorinaphylene, which are um, good solvents. So qualitatively, this is sort of telling us we're going from more one dimensional rod like um, geometries through to more three dimensional coil like geometries as the solvent goes from um, good to poor. Uh, in terms of doing some fitting, um, this is always uh, makes me a bit uncomfortable is how you extract information from this data set. So the lines are some fits we were able to do. I will not defend the analytical details of those fits to my death. Um, but the sort of the trends was at least we're getting in the radius of gyration. Uh, sort of show that as we go from chlorothaphylene through to dichlorobenzene, we sort of see a, a sort of a collapsing of the coil, but then we see an explosion in the radius of gyration as we go to these um, uh, toluene and xylene type um, solvents. So I was quite skeptical about are we really getting um, rod-like aggregates, which are about 300 nanometers um, in length. And one of my um, colleagues I collaborate with was doing some Mario Caironi looking at spin coating layers which are thinner and thinner and when they get down to really uh, small um, solution concentrations what they see in AFM is these aggregates and these aggregates are sort of rod like they're very stiff and elongated and they're also about 300 nanometers looking at sort of the scale bar so this is being cast from uh, from toluene so it seems like indeed when we have these poor solvents, we have these really almost macroscopic um, objects floating around in solution, and yet they still seem to be solvated and um, not collapsing out of solution. So our sort of idea then is that these rod-like aggregates are kind of a building block on the sort of meso scale, which helps you to um, template orientational alignment and order in films. So just like when you're trying to um, uh, float logs down a river, those logs tend to sort of associate and their long axes line up or in other liquid crystalline materials and that can help template um, this alignment. So if you're starting out with a, a coil-like conformation for your polymer, that's not necessarily going to give you long range correlated ordering of, of backbones over a long length scale. So with knowledge of that, you can choose your solvent judiciously when you're then trying to make high performance transistors. So we want the the backbones to be then aligned over a really long length scale over the length scale of our transistor. So you can do things like bar coating where you then, uh, as we saw earlier in the video, where we're coating in one direction from left to right across the sample. And you can also compare then how the mobility goes along the printing direction versus perpendicular to the printing direction. So in this plot here, it shows that if you go along the printing direction, you can get mobilities of around um, three to five centimeters square per volt second, but perpendicular is about 0.1. The spin coated has this big range, and this is what we saw before as well, because 
when we spin coat, you can't control uh, what the local orientation is going to be. So sometimes uh, your orientation of will be extending over uh, length scales larger than the channel length. And sometimes that will happen to line up with the channel length and it'll give you good mobility. And sometimes will happen to be perpendicular to the channel length and give you poor mobility. So that large variation we see is not because um, there's large variability in the quality of the transistors and per se, but rather how the backbones are orienting with respect to um, the transistor direction. So with that, my colleagues were able to, at the time, get some sort of also some nice um, uh, bandwidth data. Um, so in order to get high frequency transistors, not only do you need to get a high mobility, you need to also um, take care of some of the device details, um, but combining the directional alignment with some device engineering, we're able to get bandwidths over three uh, megahertz, which is important. We want to get those up high up for applications in things like RFID. So then uh, where we've been sort of going a bit with our research is then thinking about you know, how do we understand these alignment mechanisms, what's happening at the top surface, what's happening at the bottom surface, uh, so work I was involved with um, NIST uh, in the US, they were using a strategy which has uh, been shown before that if you use things like um, uh, nano diamond sandpaper, you can scratch your substrates and get nano grooves, which then help templating the alignment. So you can then have two things which are templating alignment, the directional uh, drying line at the top of the surface, which comes about due to blade coating, and then you can also have the influence of the bottom substrate. Uh, so you can do tricks where you can have the effects of going in opposite direction. And so you can have a, a sample where at the bottom, the polymer chains are aligned in this direction and the top surface are aligned in that direction, um, as well as obviously uh, looking at cases where you have them uh, working together. And other things we are then interested in as well, having a synchrotron next door helps this is then seeing how structure forms in real time, such as with um, X-ray scattering. So this is wide angle X-ray scattering. We are now looking at the, the crystal peaks of lamella stacking and backbone stacking and pi pi stacking. And we integrate a, a blade coater in the beam line. Uh, we, we coat the sample across the solution across our sample and measure X-ray diffraction patterns as the sample dries. Uh, so this helps us to time resolve, you know, when does uh, crystallization actually happen um, in our sample and um, how, how that relates to drying. So there is another slide coming, it's got a lot of data, here it is. Uh, so at the start of this experiment, the black line at the top here is the wet film. We can kind of track the, um, the drying by this peak here, which is the solvent, uh, which is drying. And as the sample dries, we see the emergence of um, the mala stacking the backbone stacking uh, peak in there and also the pi pi stacking peak. And it looks like with these poor solvents, um, such as um, xylene, there's already some backbone stacking which is uh, being seen in this peak, not so much lamella stacking. Um, and then as the film dries, we can see when those um, other peaks start to form. So we can do some peak fittings and see, okay, about in this case, about 230 seconds after uh, the sample was coated, it actually dries, indicating that the solvent is all seen to be gone. Uh, the pi pi stacking seems to have initiated earlier, and then the lamella stacking and um, backbone stacking kind of seem to evolve at the same time. So then wrapping up what I sort of talked about, um, controlling solution behavior of semiconducting polymers is, is key to optimizing the macroscopic charge transport. Um, I think we need to do better in terms of understanding this solution behavior. So experimentally, we're using things like solution SACs and uh, more recently SANS to actually look at the geometry of these polymer chains on the length scale of a polymer chain rather than just with optical probes. Um, and that in the case of the NDI 2D, well, N2200, uh, for poor solvents, you get really large elongated um, uh, rod-like aggregates, which seem to be sort of mesoscale objects that um, promote the long range orientational order in transistors. So again, understanding controlling in plane alignment is important for realizing uh, these high performance transistors. So it just remains to
uh, acknowledge uh, my students have been involved with this. My previous postdoc, Elliot Gann, who's now at NSWS2, Beamline scientists and collaborators, and thank you all for turning up today. So, thank you very much. Uh, Chris, so, so can we uh, please open the floor for questions? So if you would like to ask a question, uh, you can do that um, in the chat window, um, or you can unmute yourself uh, and then uh, uh, we'll see how we go. Hopefully we don't get everyone talking at once. Uh, it's a bit of an experiment in a virtual uh, environment. Uh, would anyone like to, to ask any questions? Questions, anyone? Yeah, Bronson. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, hi, Chris. Yeah. Nice hi, talk. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I always enjoys the your microstructure uh, control and wonderful uh, interface aspect to enhance the charge carrier mobility. So, just from the perspective of uh, designing the new high performing materials or to kind of control these interfaces to push this mobility close to the inorganic domain or might be in fifties or hundreds. So do you think that just the designing principle or having the long range ordering in a backbone will help or we really, I mean, there is a lot of material and device engineering aspect uh, plays a role, but how you will kind of rationalize uh, uh, kind of in terms of pushing these limits? Yeah, I mean, that's a big question. Almost the topic of a center of excellence even. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's the chemistry which affects a lot of the things on the chain. And then there's the torsional angles, the backbone stiffness, um, and then the templating. I don't know that necessarily going to really stiff backbones is the necessarily the way to go. Um, it seems that some backbone flexibility is necessary for the chains to pack and in the way they would like to. And if you make the backbone too stiff, it kind of stymies um, uh, packing. So there's quite a few polymers which have really um, stiff backbones, but they don't give as good a crystal structures as other things like PB triple T. Mm -hmm. Then again, crystal structure is not the be all and the end all, um, but I think certainly being able to get the chains to align up um, with the backbones all pointing in the same direction is important. But yeah, it's. It's, it's multifaceted because you need to understand how they behave in solution, the solvent monitor interactions and, uh, and many, many things. Yeah, I think some of these, uh, I mean, Ian McCullop, some of these polymers, which are, might be not that highly semi-crystalline and still they're amorphous and still they exhibit a very high impressive mobilities. So I think, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, apart from, yeah, molecular structuring, I think these all interfaces and I mean, looking at that particular domain wise, uh, how they are organizing in that particular uh, kind of, you know, dimensions might be, might be critical. Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks. Thank you. Uh, is there any other questions from anyone in the one. audience? I got one question. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, just interesting to know about the stability of these materials. Mm. Um, can you comment a little bit, Chris, uh, about the stability, reproducibility? Uh, morphological batch, stability, right? microstructural stability, photochemical stability. The reproducibility in terms of uh, if you do the scan for your measurement mm. once and you, there's not a scan on the tomorrow and then after tomorrow in terms of uh, how does the IV performance change with time? Yeah, we haven't systematically looked at, um, at those factors. Um, but clearly they are important and other things like bias stress. Um, so, and we test all our things in the glove box. So I think generally, well, certainly with regard to transistors, we sort of leave that to other people. We've been looking at stability in the context of solar cells a bit. Um, and N2200 seems to have quite a high photochemical stability, which is, um, seems, seems good. So other polymers such as PDV7TH are terrible. Um, but yeah, I can't really answer your questions specifically to do with OFET stability in these materials. All right. Uh, well, I think we, in the interest of time, we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, thank you very much, Chris. That was a very interesting presentation. It's a little difficult to do a round of applause over, um, over you Zoom, but uh, the um, sure. reaction buttons. There we are. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. Um, Zoom pros out there. <laughs> <laughs>